I'm seeing the conversation um, very much more uh, where leaders of some are being more willing to model the behavior that's of um, of an acceptance and normalizing of the need for mental health support in the form of a therapist. Hello and welcome aboard. Get ready for a new episode here to the Virtual Frontier. Great you have found a way back to the show. And if you just joined recently, do yourself a little favor, hit the subscribe button right away so you never miss new episodes. My today's guest is Debbie Goodman. Debbie is the group CEO of Jack Hammer, a globally operating organization based in South Africa that specializes in executive search and placement, talent adversary and leadership coaching. During the pandemic, Debbie managed to write and publish a book for leaders that lead nowadays mostly out of their living room with the catchy title, Hold On, The Living Room Leader, Leadership Lessons for the Hybrid Future. Well, that title caught my attention, so I reached out to Debbie and invited her to the show. Today, we are going to talk about learnings from the pandemic and her book, Why Mental Health Issues Are at the Peak and what patterns she recognizes looking at the future of talent acquisition and work. See you in just a flash on the other side. So hello Debbie, welcome to the Virtual Frontier. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, finally, we got together between um, you traveling between South Africa and the US and coming back from vacation, whatever. And um, yeah, happy to have you here today. Um, and um, before we start over with our conversation about um, learnings from the pandemic, what what you have written in in your book, also um, it's it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, before we dive off, maybe you can uh, give us uh, our, our audience a little introduction. Who, who is Debbie? What, what, what you're doing? What is your what is your passion in work? Okay, well, firstly, happy 2022, um, yes. happy new year. Um, this is actually my first podcast of the year, so it's exciting to be here. Um, and I, um, a little bit of context, I am the group CEO of Jack Hammer, which is a group of companies, uh, in executive search, leadership development and coaching. And we have various divisions, um, and very established longstanding business in Africa, which is where I'm from. I'm originally from Cape Town, South Africa. We have a U.S. business, and then we have a new division in blockchain and crypto, which is a global, um, offering. And um, I'm based in LA. I live in Manhattan Beach, which is a beautiful beach town in the South Bay. Um, I, um, I'm also a, I call myself a reluctant writer. I've, uh, I've just published my second book, uh, which is on the topic that we'll be talking about today. Uh, the book's called The Living Room Leader, Leadership Lessons for a Hybrid Future. Um, And I've uh, published a book prior to that um, called In the Flow, Taking Mindfulness to Work. Um, and I call myself a reluctant writer because I actually really do not like writing at all. <laughs> But it's something I just kind of feel compelled to do from time to time. And I go, oh, I really want to share this with the world. And so it's, um, it's a really, it's a, a bit of a labor of love. And I'm definitely not going to write a book this year. So um Yeah, that's a little, that's a little bit of context. So oh, about the writing, maybe I have to get together with you because I have also like this, I don't want to write, but I have to say something and then I, I, I'm ending always up and doing nothing. So, but I can probably learn from you there. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, but I remember uh, reading your profile and your history that you uh, came originally from a completely different background. Uh, and maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit on that. You're, you were a dancer. Um, Uh, a professional one, actually. And uh, I, I would like to also know how this um, past career of your um, did help you um, to thrive in as a business owner and what what parts of that uh, old um, uh, profession did you take over with you and in, in, into the mm. um, role as a business owner of different companies? It's so interesting. I feel like the most interesting thing about me is the fact that I used to be a prof professional dancer and choreographer. 
Um, and it is a very fascinating, wonderful life. And um, I was very fortunate in being able to pursue that professionally for um, into my late 20s. Um, I was also at the same time um, pursuing a law degree. And I eventually got to the end of my law degree. I could no longer consider myself a student. I could no longer live at home. And um, I was a broke, penniless, injured dancer and Hmm. eventually had to accept the reality that I was going to need to figure out something else in terms of my future. So it was with great reluctance that I eventually retired as a, as a professional choreographer, performer, artist, um, and by chance found a job in a recruitment firm. Um, and very soon discovered that I actually was able to apply the similar creativity and discipline that I'd used in my life as a, as a professional artist in the world of business. I mean, I'm a terrible employee, so I only actually worked for somebody else for um, no more than two years and then went off to do my own thing as I had done as a, as a performer, you know, you're, you know, I'd been part of a professional dance company for a while, but you really need to be, um, producing and directing and doing your own PR and figuring out your own budgets and pulling in people to work with you and collaborate. So you're essentially running your own little mini businesses, um, even in, in that world. And mm. I guess the, um, I really found such a tremendous amount of creativity and excitement and innovation in running businesses and leading teams that I, yes, I, I do miss the days of rehearsals and being on the stage and that kind of thing. But, um, but I've found equal gratification, um, being in the world of business, which I absolutely, I adore. I love building things. And so I'm able to really put all of my energy and creativity into that. Are there still, um, like things from your past, like tra- training that you have done before that's, that you still keep practicing that, uh, keep you sharp in, 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 in your daily business today? I mean, that's a great question. Um, so I often tell people, you know, the discipline that you need in order to be a professional athlete or a professional artist, um, there's, there's daily discipline. There's the repeat action of their exercises. And I mean, as a dancer, There's these, there's every single day you go to a dance class and you practice and you do almost a similar set of exercises repetitively day after day. And each day you're trying to improve and get better and get stronger and tweak and find ways to, you know, to be, to be better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess that rigor is something that I still, I certainly apply in my, um, in my work day. Um, there are certain things that I'm really, really disciplined about. I think you'll probably find similar, something similar to people who've been in the military or, um, uh, you know, who've been used to a level of this is what we do. Otherwise we don't feel good about the day. And so, um, you know, I know that there are many entrepreneurs who are pretty sort of like all over the show and not very structured. That's not me. I'm super structured about, um, about all of the things that I do. It's the way that I know it's not the only way, but it's, it's definitely helped me, um, to pursue and grow, um, you know, the kinds of businesses that I have, which I've always bootstrapped actually. I've never, um, I've never sourced outside funding. I've never done the capital raising thing. I've always, you know, plugged away and, and grown steadily, but surely. You mentioned when, uh, When I started the conversation that you came originally, or you come up originally from South uh, uh, Africa, and then uh, a couple of years ago, you moved uh, to Los Angeles and started all over again um, with your, with your business. And well, I can just, uh, uh, well, I know because I did something similar that uh, this takes a lot of efforts and um, a lot of action, actually. Why and, and how did you do this whole process of, of relocating and then um, redefining yourself in, a, I, I, I guess, a really competitive uh, environment in, in, in the United States and Los Angeles in particular? Uh, what, what happened there? 
Well, opportunity presented itself, um, an amazing opportunity to relocate with my family. And, mm. um, and so that was hard to turn down. The business in my business in Africa was at a mature phase. I already had things running pretty smoothly. Um, and so I actually moved to become almost, you know, a remote digital worker from the time that I relocated way before COVID. So um, it was interesting in that we spent a number of months transitioning all of the things that I'd used to be doing in the office. Oh, won't you just sign this thing for me? These accounts, this document, this, we needed to figure out how to do that remotely. And I actually spent about uh, three months, even when I was still in, still in Cape Town, I, I stopped going to the office. I said, I've got to figure this whole thing out. Is I'm, going to be 10 hour, I'm going to be nine or 10 hours away. And yep. so I've got to figure out all the things that I'm used to doing in person. I've got to be able to do um, uh, digitally and remotely. And um, I'm going to get back to the story about the why and the start of the new, the new business. But realizing that it took three months for me to figure that out but the rest of the world when COVID came had to do this over a weekend to figure out yeah. how to go remote i mean it's it, it was damn tough and you know people were really forced to figure things out i'm very glad that i had the the sort of the timelines that i had to do all of that anyway moved to the us and originally the intention was not to start up again in executive search. I was like, I'm done with that. I've done that before. I want, to try, I want to try new things. And so I spent probably the first year just throwing seeds into new fields and seeing what might arise. And it was wonderful and exciting and fabulous. And being in California in particular, which is the epicenter of entrepreneurship, and venture capital, um, it was um, pretty amazing. And you know, the, you know the saying, nobody ever has a bad meeting in LA. All the meetings are great, but they don't necessarily go anywhere. You've got to keep showing up consistently over and over. And it's really, one can get very demoralized. And there were definitely times when I was having a bit of a pity party for myself going, won't somebody just give me a break here? But the reality <laughs> is that it actually takes time. And mm. you can't, you, you've got to give yourself that time horizon. Anyway, then COVID came in 2020 um, and I needed to put my attention back on the Africa business and making sure that we would get through it. And, um, and so I, I had my eye on that for a fair amount of 2020. So it was really 2021 that I was ready to say, okay, we're putting, putting our roots and foundations here. And that's when I got fully into building the executive search business, um, in the U S and once again, it's, it's taken a lot of time, leveraging networks, knocking on lots of doors, showing up consistently, adding value over and over and over and over, not expecting anything in return, you know, being able to show up in the, uh, you know, with the, at the right level, with the right people, um, is something that um, it requires a lot of discipline and you can't take things personally when it's not happening along, you know, when it's not happening quickly, you know, to just mm -hmm. keep, keep on, keep on going. I guess that's yep. where sort of the, the discipline of training for something where you don't necessarily see the results immediately comes into really good stead. Yep. So I can, I can, uh, um, Tell the same, same, more, more the, the same story, not, but, uh, similar that it just takes like really time. And if you're, if you're getting tired after relocating from uh, one country to a different one, um, that's probably not the right move for you because it's could be getting retiring over the time and you just need to continue. Right. Um, after I think it took me like two or three years, like to really settle in from moving from Germany to Mexico. You know? mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, now, 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 now I'm arrived. I'm here, right? <laughs> I'm settled uh, in, in some, in some aspect. Yeah. I mean, I think it's usually a roundabout. If you know, um, if you're prepared to really go for it, um, I'd say it's about a two year time horizon, excepting mm -hmm. when there's a global pandemic in the middle of it all, in which case you need to extend that by another year of roundabout. Yeah. So <laughs> for anybody who was trying to make these transitions in the middle of it all. Um, that was, that was tough. 
but also presented opportunity. You know, so exactly. I, um, I, I've seen so many incredible entrepreneurs who seize the opportunity to pivot, to let go of things that weren't working, to try new things. Um, for so many of us, our worlds have changed um, for the better um, and won't go back. Um, but there's, there are equally um, so many dilemmas, particularly and challenges, particularly in the working world right now. So um, when I um, eventually had to get uh, the living room leader into the publishers because they were saying, we're on a deadline here. You can't keep editing. I felt like I, um, I was leaving half the story out or that by the time the book actually got published and printed, that COVID would be over and nobody would be interested. And <laughs> the story is still evolving. There's certainly things in the book that are a little out of date, but, um, but it's not over and hybrid is, um, is, a, is a massive challenge for everybody still. Mm. As you, has, you have brought already like uh, long before the pandemic with this transition to get, and I, I just uh, can recommend that to every leader or business owner that would like to go really full remote or uh, hybrid, whatever, um, this move you did perfectly, just go from out for out from the office, move somewhere else in, in your country, get uh, or work from home uh, as most of us uh, do uh, today. And then you get uh, like the real experience, what it really takes um, to yeah, get your company like running um, independently from a location. Uh, um, but um, what I would like to ask is, uh, as, as you have already prepared all this and, and you, you did this experience uh, a time before, Did you notice any like changes or challenges like that came up uh, during the pandemic um, that you now maybe have uh, um, worked on and or dissolved that you could share? So it was all very well me being remote. We'd figured that out. But the rest of my team were actually mostly in office. Yeah. And so we still needed to figure out that piece. Um, so it wasn't a big, a big shift for the rest of my team when, um, they were used to me not being in the office. Um, but, um, it was quite a big deal to get everybody else to work remotely. Now, bearing in mind that, um, in a country like South Africa, things like bandwidth and IT speed and the kinds of, is, is, not a, is, is not something that you can take for granted. Yep. There's also things like uh, the, the, what we refer to as load shedding, which is the power just goes out. Now, this is something that happens in Africa, maybe in some other developing countries as well. But the thing that you need in order to work effectively remotely is you need power and you need bandwidth. And that mm -hmm. is not something that we could always rely on consistently. And I must say that my team are superstars with figuring out patch arounds and um, figuring out how to make it work. But that was a, so that was just the infrastructure was really hard. Um, then, I mean, this is nothing new, but you had um, people who with young kids at home. Yeah. And I mean, this is not a unique story to me. I've never felt more, um, pity really for anybody than the people who had toddlers and toddlers at home or kids who needed help with schooling. So that was another massive challenge to figure out when would be a suitable time for certain members of our team to actually work. So what we said was there's, we transitioned, and this was a, one of the great, great lessons. We transitioned from people working synchronously to people working when they could. So we had some people starting really early, working really late, schooling their kids in the middle, et cetera. So for some, it meant a really long day, but the, up, the, you know, the, the productivity was there. And so that was an interesting um, shift and something that we've sustained. Um, but what I had to have people realize was that, um, The day feels unbelievably long when part of the day that you used to spend in the office, you're now using for your personal stuff, which now you still your personal and family stuff. So 
um, pre-COVID, people would go to the office and that's where you'd spend your time. Somebody else would do the home stuff, the kids stuff, the, all those things. Now everybody moved home and we're working early in the morning, late in the evening, doing personal family stuff during the day. And this exhaustion that comes about because the day feels so unbelievably long. And so really just helping people see that that day is long, but it has shifted in terms of its components and the time in which we're doing our work. Um, the other really important thing, and once again, not a new story, but is um, on helping everybody in the team to stay connected and to feel connected to one another, even though they weren't seeing each other in person. And the really awesome thing about my, um, the, what we do have established is we've got a daily check-in that we had established way before COVID. And that was a lifesaver because people on a daily basis had a way of in a structured format connecting to say, to share how they, how they were doing, how they were feeling, what the challenges were. Um, and was something that was already in, uh, you know, baked into the daily, the daily communication. So that turned out to be, uh, you know, a really critical, um, connection point for everybody. Yeah. I, I, I feel that uh, is also in the teams I, I work with uh, really important uh, having this constant structured communication about, okay, what is going well, what is missing and, and just not losing this, this uh, kind of connection. Mm. As you have uh, uh, written your book um, and talked uh, in your business, I, I, um, you, you're talking constantly with, uh, with business leaders and CEOs. After this two year period, uh, what are their m biggest concerns right now or what are they worried about? Uh, what is maybe coming or I, I don't know, you, you are, I guess, much more in touch with uh, business leaders and CEOs on this level. So what is, what is their concern? It's, their it's a really mixed bag. I think some have transitioned to remote leadership very effectively. Others really can't wait to be back in office and are, you know, constantly making plans and then having to make new plans about how to, how to congregate together. It was going to be last September, then it was going to be November, then it was going to be January. Now there's Omicron. So, you know, the <laughs> moving goalposts is just endless. No. Um, I spoke to one a CEO of a, 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 a big blue chip uh, company, a fortune 500 company who said it was really easy to get people to work remotely in comparison to figuring out how to get them back in the office. And I think that is the biggest dilemma, trying to see people, people really want something that's hyper-personalized to them. Employees have had an opportunity to see alternatives and to work in an alternative way. For some, it's been very effective. For others, not so much. For the ones where it's been really effective, great, they're either no longer traveling as much or they're no longer commuting as much or they're just feeling better about their lives because they have this flexibility, they do not want to go back into the office. For others who love the social connection, who can't stand working on their own, who are not productive working on their own, who have kids at home, who they want to get the hell out of their homes and back into an office. Um, for leaders and managers, they, some of them w want to believe that they are, that there's only a certain type of work that can happen in person. And to a certain measure, there's, uh, there's some, I think there's, there's definitely some measure to, uh, some store in think in that thinking. There's certain activities and there's certain kinds of group collaboration sessions that undoubtedly are best done in person. We can have all the nifty gimmicks and gadgets and whiteboard, remote whiteboards. There's nothing that beats in person, I still believe. <laughs> um, and so now it's about trying to figure out how to support and accommodate most of the people most of the time 
because you are absolutely not going to be able to accommodate all the people all the time when there's a hybrid. And making policies around full-time in office is also not going to work. And equally, full-time remote for some people will be very challenging. So it's the need for extraordinary creativity and trying to, um, and, and so the, I think that, the, that leaders who are, who are successfully doing this are actually looking at their organizations on a team by team basis, as opposed to a global uh, look. What does yeah. this team need? Because depending on the kind of work and depending on the type of people, may be something very different to what another team needs. And so when it's like looking at the organization in that context, those leaders seem to be really succeeding. Um, the biggest challenge as well is helping people feel connected and that they belong and that there's meaning and value to the work that they're doing. And that's probably one of the biggest precursors to what we see now in the US being the great resignation um, is the lack of that. Yeah. And so the huge challenge for, um, and the onus is on, is on leaders, but it's a collective, it's a co-creation. Belonging is co-creation, but it's spearheaded by leaders. And so where companies can do that, they are, and where leaders are, are able to do that, they're being more successful. How could companies and or, or leaders in particular become there more, or like in a profound way, more inclusive and like, let's say, just like more interested in the well-being of their 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 employees and, and co-workers? Because as you as you just mentioned, I, I I see that also. Right, you have on the one side maybe the CEO or uh, the leader say, oh, I know we want to have all back in the office as fast as possible, no? And on the other side, you have like this other groups, diff different groups, some some. As you just mentioned, for some that uh, remote work is uh, is doing great, other ones they are struggling with that. How, how you bring that together? You just mentioned like this, uh, looking at the issue at, as a you know, on a team level, right? What needs the team? But I I wondering more about like really caring about it that in a profound way, not just saying hmm, we roll out uh, just a new policy. <laughs> um, Daniel, I don't know that you can make people care who don't care. I mean, either, the, either you really care okay, or you don't, you know, good, so, good um, yeah. so, um, you know, there's this, uh, there's been so much um, written and spoken about conscious leadership and empathetic leadership and all those things. The reality is I, I actually, um, I gave a lecture at, um, it was one of my first in-person sessions at Pepperdine University at, to one of their business classes, business school classes. And I went around the class and I said, guys, Tell me the qualities that you think a leader should have. And each person, there must be, I don't know, 30 people in the, in the class, and um, each person said something else. Adaptable, empathetic, understanding, visionary, all, you know, all the words. And I said to them, that is one heck of a responsibility to put on to one human. You are not going to find that in one human because here's the thing, leaders are human too. Now, the expectation is that somebody who's leading a team should have the kind of people-oriented qualities that um, make them qualified for leadership. The reality is not all leaders do. Many leaders are selected because of their business capability, because of their acumen when it comes to numbers, because of their, um, their non-people centric qualities. We know that. And empathy and caring and love and compassion and understanding is not high on their list of qualities. Yet they are effective leaders, not necessarily people managers. So how can, so I think organizations um, where leaders are, have got less of the people orientation in environments, in the kind of environment we have now, we're seeing them really struggle because the expectation 
and demand from people, the workers, is that that's what they want and that's what they need. Leaders also have many, many stakeholders. Depending on how, how close they are to the senior leadership, they have got so many stakeholders that they need to answer to. And they have got many competing interests. That's not, uh, my belief is you do right by your people. You'll have amazing productivity. You'll have incredible talent pools. You'll have, I mean, the numbers will just skyrocket too. I believe that those go hand in hand. Great people, great outcomes. Engaged mm-hmm. people, amazing outcomes. People who feel passionate and connected to the work they do, the people that they work with, and most importantly, the boss that they work for, stay at an organization. So my personal belief is that if you don't have that orientation towards caring about people, you're going to, the, the likelihood is that the, the, res, the, you know, the financial results could suffer. We do see that that's not necessarily always the case, but that's, I'm from the, the, the school of love and loyalty. Mm. And um, I believe that that actually impacts hardcore business results when it comes to the, the financial profits and productivity. Yeah. Another uh, topic I would like to discuss uh, and uh, um, elaborate and, and discover with you is uh, that the mental health issues around the globe are uh, at peaks um, and even before the pandemic now, even worse. <laughs> so um, there are still like a lot of companies and organizations that are vehemently like just like neglect this issue. This is something personal. Um, Well, I, I don't care if my, my coworker has a stomach itch, whatever, but, um, mental health issues are like really influencing like the business outcomes on all, all levels. So knowing that, and I, I mean, the, 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 the company owner or the CEO do, does know it, but there's like not much action, even, even, even further, I would say there's a lot of hiding around that, um, from all parties, from the employees that are worried, um, if they show vulnerability or they, they they commit or they, they, they confess that they have like mental health issues um, that could be a, a break point in their career. What, why, why is that? And how, how maybe you have an idea how we could uh, uh, tackle that. Wow. This is a topic all on its own. Don't get me started. Yeah, we could make a podcast for it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Don't get me. St- well, you're getting me started. So let's settle in here. Um, so first of all, one of the best things that I came out of COVID was that, that came, has come out of COVID in the workplace is that the spotlight has come onto mental health in a very much more magnified way than ever before. And so, um, what I'm seeing in work environments is that there are many more organizations than they used to be who are paying a lot of attention to mental wellness, uh, in, in many different ways. Um, and so I'll speak about what are the positive things that I, that I'm seeing happening is there's the awareness that there, that, that many people are suffering mentally and emotionally. And there is the, um, the desire and support, uh, systems that are being put in place to try to address those. Now, I'm not sure exactly what percentage of organizations are doing that but many more than they were pre-COVID for sure. Um, the challenges to that. So here's the, 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 the support and help comes in the following types of ways. So organizations set up support groups. They are mm. offering to have, um, some have employed full-time or part-time psychological counselors, therapists, um, et cetera, to provide uh, in, almost in-house psychological support. So whereas they might have offered a business coaching or life coaching, psychological support is now an additional benefit that some companies are offering. But I've seen many even small businesses um, have somebody available who comes in once a month or has come in to do periodic sessions individually and in groups. Um, I'm seeing the conversation um, very much more uh, where leaders are some are being more willing to model the behavior that's of, um, of an acceptance and normalizing of the need for mental health support in the form of a therapist. Now, 
once again, I don't know the percentage, but I'm having many more conversations where it's no longer an issue or a taboo to say, to re reference one's therapist. Um, but there are me but for the reasons that you've said, um, it's still a challenge to sometimes execute on these support programs because it is still taboo and because mm. employees really are still very much more worried about some kind of judgment about their mental state than they would be if they actually got COVID. So yeah, it's fine it's to say, hey, I got COVID or I broke my leg or yeah, I've got a back spasm mind, uh, or there's no. something wrong with me physically. People are okay to, to they're completely fine to say, sorry, the doctor booked me off because I'm sick. They're yep. far more reluctant to say, I'm suffering from anxiety. I'm suffering from burnout. I'm suffering from depression. And therefore, I need a leave of absence, or I need two weeks off, or I need some other kind of support. There is much greater reluctance to, um, to be open about that because there is still some kind of taboo. And the reality is that I'm still seeing um, situations where people will get, people are being passed up for opportunities, promotions. Um, extensions of responsibility because there's, uh, it's a double edged sword. On the one hand, it's like, oh, I, I don't want to bother you too much. I don't want to stress you out too much by giving you this added responsibility. Um, and then there's, so there's partly the care. I don't, from a manager who thinks to about somebody who's maybe suffering from burnout. Well, I don't want to give you this promotion. You're burnt out. Um, so it's partly care, partly, um, you know, a bias to a degree. So it's a very tricky thing for people to openly share that they, that they're struggling and that they're suffering. Um, what I actually did, and, and this is a, a personal uh, use case. <laughs> so here's my case study on, um, trying to get mental health benefits to be taken up in a company. The beginning of 2021. The beginning of the year, I said to my whole team, I said, guys, I want everybody here to have a therapist. I have a therapist. I have a business coach. I've got all the support that I need. It takes a whole village to keep me sane. Mm -hmm. I am, would, I would want all, each of you, either we'll find a therapist for you. You can find it on your own. I provide the budget for you. It'll be confidential. You, everybody here needs support. I thought everybody would be so excited and they would like snap this up. Because what a great what? benefit to have. Uh, and could, uh, the first end, three months, happened? nobody. Ah. End, of Q, end of Q1 goes, I go, guys, I still on offer. It's still on offer. I want you to have, take this up. It's so important. I have a therapist. I see somebody regularly. So I was also trying to model and trying to normalize the fact that this is not something to be shame, ashamed of. There's no shame in this. You know, I'm not coping in certain parts of my life. I need help. They're professionals to do mm. that. You know, if you want to get really, if you want to be a, a you know, really good at, at a, a athletic discipline, you get a, you get a coach, you get a trainer. If you want to be robust mm. mentally, you need somebody to help you with that. Anyway, yeah. it took about six to nine months before slowly, slowly, everybody started taking up the benefit. But the real clincher was I said, guys, you've got X amount of budget till the end of the year, use it or lose it. Now's your chance. I'm insisting. So I was pretty forceful about it. But the most wonderful thing that happened was that by the end of the year, we've only got one gentleman in our team, one guy in our team, it's an all female team. By the end of the year, we had the one guy in the team um, being very open and actually sharing about the fact that his therapist had mentioned to him or recommended something to him. And I was like, wow, that is a real progress. That is real achievement that people are being comfortable to talk openly about this. So it's my recommendation to others who are recognizing the need for support is mm. be consistent, keep talking about it. Don't expect people to be openly willing to share immediately. Keep on at it and keep modeling it. Keep, make budget available for it. Just as you would make budget available for team building, 
make budget available for mental wellness. Yeah. Good point. Really good point. David, I, I think you're an exceptional leader in this aspect. You, you, you made this offer to your, to your employees and, and the people you work with, um, like getting, getting help, uh, trying to change things there. Um, I, I think I have, and then after that, I'm going to stop playing a uh, devil's advocate, uh, but <laughs> I think I, sometimes I feel, um, things are going off rail with, uh, um, companies trying to find, uh, the right talent and getting things moving there. Um, you mentioned before the, the great resignation, and I think this is not just, not something just, um, Bent to United States, whatever. I think this is happening all over the globe. I, I just talked last week with someone um, that told me in in China there's a whole anti-work movement. So mm -hmm. they they just re resigned to completely to work, you know, and then say, okay, what's happening there? And I see uh, exceptionally leaders like you um, doing a lot of things for for the people they work with. They're really interested. But on the other side, when I looked in the preparation for for an, uh, uh, survey uh, that was done by manpower um where they actually described that uh, one, one one of the things that they are doing right now to attract more talent is that many companies are lowering or completely um abolishing their um initial drug screening test when someone is uh, coming into the company so um if i was a, a pothead or coke user before I would never get hired in a company, but now they are lowering this this the, um, this entrance uh, barrier um, just to get like the right talents onboarded or just to get any talent onboarded. What is, what is happening there? I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, I, 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 wow. I, yeah. So which part of it? Um, so yes, there is. There has been um, a great re- reawakening and revisioning for people who have spent the last two years working under tremendous additional stress and pressure. If not the, you know, if the workplace wasn't stressful enough already, um, the last two years have just been consistently tough for almost everybody. Um, and We know from, so um, I've done a lot of research um, through Jack Hammer. We, we um, every year we put out, a, a, you know, some new data and research and we've done a lot of research on why do people stay at an organization and why do they leave? This is pre-COVID. But I think the same exists now in, and what we're seeing in the great resignation is that people stay They want to feel, that, so they, they stay because they like the work that they're doing. One of the main reasons they stay is because of the person, because of the person that they report to, they have a good mm. relationship with that person and they have a good relationship with the people that they work with. And they feel that they are adding value and there's some meaning in the work that they do. Obviously, there's also, they've got to be paid well. They've got to be good benefits. So let's put that aside. Um, and it's that, that part of the qualitative part of the work that we do that's been very missing for a lot of people. And it's not to say that all of a sudden there were a whole bunch of terrible bosses out there. No. It's just that people, um, people stopped feeling connected. And if... Um, and if the relationship with one, the person you report to and the relationship with the people you work with and the work that you do doesn't feel like you're, um, that there's meaning in the work and you're under tremendous pressure and you're suffering from burnout, any new opportunity is going to feel like something better. So it's a bunch of those variables that have sort of co that, that, that coexist at this time in our lives, which mean that people will look at new opportunities exceptionally quickly, but more so they are reevaluating their, their lives and they're going, I just can't take this anymore. I just, this is just not feeling good to me any longer. I attended a, um, a, a LinkedIn live session with Seth Godin last weekend 
and um, it was on this topic, the Great Resignation. And the the question is why? You know, there's data and there's research studies, but like, why? Why is this happening? And it really is about that sense of meaning and belonging. And it sounds like such a, a soft, you know, the soft issues we talk about. <laughs> but this meaning and belonging are two critical features that have been completely overlooked in why we make decisions to work one place or another or not to work at all. And so it's, it's been easier in the past when we worked in person. It was much easier to form relationships. It was easier to sustain relationships. And it was easier to feel an energy and a vibe when we worked in person. Without that, we have one piece of the puzzle that is diluted. Um, you would be able to attend group meetings where the leader would be able to talk about the vision and you would be able to feel inspired and the, the, the energy around collaboration and working towards something. People would feel excited about that. Do that via Zoom? Not so much. Mm, much um, more difficult. Much more difficult. And then that feeling of just, do I belong here? Very hard to sustain or create remotely. So there's another really good, there's another wonderful author that I always um, speak about when I talk, I talk about this topic, Daniel Pink. He's written many books and uh, another one of my favorites. And he talks about why do people um, stay motivated? Why, how to get the best engagement um, out of employees? There are three factors. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so to a degree, people have had autonomy. They've had more autonomy and they've enjoyed more autonomy working remotely. Mastery, they need to feel like they are progressing, like they're actually getting better at things, that there's a feedback loop. And that has been lacking for a lot of people. And that's a manager's responsibility, but it's also some people don't take feedback very well. Um, so that those, those feedback loops, that feeling of I'm progressing towards something and I'm getting better at something and I'm adding value here, that has been lacking. And then the last bit is no. the absolutely critical piece, purpose. I feel like the work that I do matters, matters to the company, matters to the outside world, matters to me and that I am valued here. And that part has been the most significantly impacted when there is dysfunctional leadership or lack of attention to helping people to feel connected in that way. And so I think that the reason why people are really reevaluating their lives is primarily because of, not because they're not getting a, a, a good, good enough salary, although certainly money matters and in your lower minimum wage workers for sure money is critical. I'm talking, you know, my world is professional workers and um, uh, knowledge workers, et cetera. So that's really my domain. Um, money is le much less of an issue, um, although not to minimize it once again. It's all the other things. The, how do I feel about my life and my life at work? If there's no joy here, mm. why do it? And people just are going, yep. if there's no joy here, I want out. Exactly. And I, I, I don't remember uh, where, where I stumbled over this number, um, but there's a great percentage of people that would actually, in this, in this field of knowledge workers and um, uh, higher payments, that would actually um, accept a lower payment if there would be better purpose and a really a meaningful work uh, behind everything, right? So um, this is also an uh, aspect to take care of. Yeah. I mean, I think also generationally, you know, there's lots being spoken about millennials, Gen Z, et cetera. I think it is an era of workers, a generation of workers who have got different values and um, it's impossible to ignore that now. If you're not paying attention to that, if organizations are not paying attention to that, they're, they're going to struggle to um, to attract and retain the kind of quality people that they want into the future. What brings me also to my to my next uh, um, part because I would like to talk with you also about like the future of talent and the future of work. What is what is what is coming? And uh, my question there would would be what 
what is your or what you do envision for for the next five or three to three to five years, whatever? Um, how will the the talent talent market look? How how things will move? Maybe you ha maybe you we can see right now what will happen, but maybe you can also already detect some some patterns uh, on, on the way to that. Um, if you have something, um, would love uh, if you could share that. So thank you, first of all, for bringing the timeline into two to three years. I've had a couple of other um, media requests from journalists who've asked me about 10 years. And I'm like, I have okay. absolutely no idea. And none of us do. So if I'm going to just put it out there that I have no clue about what things are going to look like in 10 years time, yeah. none of us do. But two to three years, I can... I can certainly start seeing how things, um, how things are evolving. Um, and in one respect, it's this idea of rethinking the nature of, of our relationship with a company that we use the word employs us. Um, the, the nature of that contract is going to shift. It already has in that, you know, we know that there's a large economy of gig workers. But if what we're seeing now is that some of our most talented people are choosing to be, to work as contractors or choosing more autonomy or choosing more flexibility, um, it could be that some of what we usually do is we say, well, we've got our core group of workers, they're full-time employees, and then we'll have some contractors, consultants, freelancers, et cetera, there on the periphery. I think that that balance is likely to shift because companies are going to need to figure out how to engage with some incredibly talented people in this non-formal full-time employment relationship on a much greater basis than they have in the past. So imagine mm. the, major, the balance from the minority of your workforce being non-full-time employees to that balance shifting. How do we do that? How do we um, look at alternative ways of engaging with talented people um, in, on, on their terms. Um, and so I think that that is going to be a, be a shift. I think that one of the challenges to that is less about work policies and healthcare benefits and all that kind of thing. I think, I think it's more around how do we create a culture and set of values with people who are not necessarily full-time employees and companies that can get that right and can start really to not just codify the DNA of how of the culture and help even those non-full-time employees to feel belonging, that's where the magic sweet sauce, secret sauce is. So that's a shift that I, I see starting to play out and, and make sense in the light of what we're seeing with people departing from formal employment and wanting things on their terms. And the on their terms is, I guess, the next shift. It's this idea of hyper-personalization. Um, people are wanting to use their time and resources and energy in ways that suit them. And that is different to how we thought about it in the past. Usually it's got to be the way it suits the employer because there's a power dynamic there, right? So the power dynamic is whoever pays the salaries, whoever pays the bills has the power and everybody else has got to just, you know, fit in line. Um, the, once again, I'm talking about my domain of work, which is in the knowledge workspace. Um, I think that figuring out how to provide hyper-personalized experiences for individuals is another is another shift because the power dynamic is shifting, and I'm seeing this already happening in um, uh, in the blockchain crypto space. Mm, so, sure. um, first of all, many uh, crypto companies, blockchain based companies, um, in have got um, the way in which they're structured is that you can have developers working on code who are not necessarily employed, and there is a much greater fluidity in how people engage in some blockchain companies to any others I've seen. There's also the nature of this idea of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, where the, where the policies, the, proceed, the, the rules of engagement are determined by the community. 
And so there's this idea that, yeah. that the people who work on a project or work on an or who work in an organization all have a say. And so this may be sounding a little, um, a little out there, but I think it's, um, it's something that's being tested right now on a more mass scale than it has been before. And it'll be very interesting to see whether that, how that works. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily placing any predictions on that. I think that things will, you know, you know, animal farm, there are some that are created equal, but others are more equal than others. So, um, everybody's created equal, some are more equal than others, but I, I'm, I'm not sure how, how that's going to work. I think that there will always be leaders. There will always be pioneers. There will always be those that set things in motion. There will always be those that are good at followership, um, as opposed to leadership, but I'm seeing potentially a power dynamic shift. Um, and then of course, no. um, of course, the, the, the interest, the, the infrastructure being the hybrid. And that is going to be the commonplace. That's going to be the absolute middle of the road is hybrid. And I think what companies need to remember is that hybrid does, is not just about, um, it's not just about in the office and out the office. It's also about how do we collect our people together from time to time because in-person does matter. How do we shift the office from a place where people work to a place of purpose? So what do we do in the office that we, that we need to do in the office that we couldn't do as effectively working from home? So if you're going to insist that people do collect in person and gather in, an, in, a, in physical space, what are you doing there during that time? that people don't feel resentful that they could have done exactly the same thing working from their home office. And so thinking intentionally and deliberately about how the, um, how the office becomes a place of purpose is another shift and another layer of thinking. If we can, if organizations can do that, if leaders can, um, can provide that environment where when we gather, it's something that's meaningful, people will love to be there. I've seen that. I've seen that already. And so that's another thinking, um, another thinking shift. Um, but in person has got to be part of the hybrid. So, um, we've seen that relationships are formed, but we know relationships are formed better in person. There's the stuff that happens. The, the, the other really critical thing that, that we also do know is that learning happens better in person. And so is the office a place of learning? Because I believe that it should be. There's all the remote learning that you can do. There's all the online onboarding courses that you can do, but being in person and learning from people who know more than you in person is another really important piece of the jigsaw puzzle. I'm going to take a breath there. Got you. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, my last question for today, and then maybe you can... Uh, um, Give also some 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 closing words. What 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 you think is important uh, important takeaway for for our audience um, would be the one thing that you think is important for a company owner or a leader um, to take action up on today um, to stay relevant in in the near future. Goodness, the punchline. Um, I would recommend that. If you haven't already taken a look at everything, all the ways of working um, and taken a look at them and asked yourself, is this relevant? Why are we doing it like this? What needs to change? Then you should be doing that. And more importantly, asking the people that you work with what's important to them. Because leaders think that they need to have all the answers. And that is not the way of, maybe the way of the past, but definitely not the way of the future. Ideas come from everywhere. And sometimes the best ideas come from the people in your organization and your team that you least expect. And so mm. these solutions can be co-created. And they get co-created by the people who it matters to the most. And so thinking up the perfect strategies and the perfect plans on your own, even with your colleagues and peers, is working in an echo chamber. Do not do that. 
Examine everything and do that with the people who it matters to the most. Because when you can do that, people feel buy-in. They feel connected. They feel like they were part of a new solution. And then it's testing. We're in this incredibly beautiful no man's land of, no woman's land of, um, of trying things out. So my recommendation is don't put anything in policy. Don't make any hard and fast rules. Test, beta test, beta test over and over. Be okay for things not to work. Some of the things that you think are great ideas will fail. Try again and get the co collaboration and the input and the feedback from the people who it matters to most. When you do that, you'll have en engaged, engaged groups and engaged teams, and you don't have to be the one that comes up with all the answers all the time. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Debbie, if um, someone of our, from our audience or people that are listening today uh, would like to get in touch with you, know more about your work, um, what is the best way? Best way is I'll give out my um, I'll give out my email address. Um, so that okay, is gonna put it. Uh, that is Debbie at jhammerglobal.com. Also LinkedIn. So um, it's Debbie Goodman. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, it's probably the the most effective ways of of getting in touch. I have a bunch of other socials and all the rest, but um, are less consistent in terms of um, in terms of being able to respond. Great. We're going to put it all in the show notes below and people okay. can then uh, pick up on that what works best for them. Fantastic. Debbie, thank you very much for this uh, awesome conversation and, and your insights, especially with all the background you have uh, um, uh, gained over the last couple of uh, years in this field of work. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. Hope to see you soon in another one. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Take, I'm so glad we finally got it together. So, um, yes. have a wonderful, have a wonderful 2022. Thanks, Daniel. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Back we are from an exciting trip into Debbie's world of work. If you want to get more confident when it comes to the rapidly changing environment in a hybrid world of work and learn what a living room leader needs to get right, get a copy of Debbie's book. Find the link in the show notes below. We hope you found this session helpful and you have now some new tools and insight on how to create better workplaces for the future. What you have missed in this episode? How can we do better? Let us know in the comments and reviews. And as always, before you leave, hit the subscribe button, give a thumb up and share this episode around with your friends and colleagues. Your action helps us to grow the show and keep you informed and updated on trending topics about the future of work. On behalf of the team here at The Virtual Frontier, I want to thank you for listening. So until the next episode, keep exploring your frontiers.